All right, guys, here we are. Sunday afternoon, lots going on in town, and we're so fortunate to have you guys here to enjoy these amazing people, uh, amazing artists, and thank you again. Uh, I want to thank all of you guys for, for being here. I know that many of you actually enjoy theater and improv comedy, and it's one of those things we're trying to build. And so definitely let your friends know if you enjoy this evening, let them know that they're going to be coming back on an ongoing basis. So we want to make sure we're going to be capturing it on three camera high definition video. We have Chip over here doing the sound, sound engineer. Put our hands together for Chip, John Sprague. So we're going to be putting a little scissor reel form of we'll have it, and we're going to be doing this with a lot of the different things we do. Uh, one quick shout out before I announce the, these guys. Um, is that Lojo Simon, our artist of the year here for Laguna Beach, is going to be uh, presented on Tuesday. Uh, and it's one of the generational, the Vidor, Eldor Vidor. And uh, it's, it's been in, getting incredible reviews. So I just want to make sure that you know that's here on Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. We'll let everybody know. And for right now, let's put our hands together for, uh, let's have Brian, Brian Lomans. <laughs> Broadway your way. out those cards in the lobby. Really yes, thank you very that. much. It's going to help us as we create our show today. Uh, uh, we wanted to introduce ourselves. I I'm Philip Stark. And I'm Ken Bellwether. Welcome, everybody. To our one and only... Thank you. First and last time... Tribute to... A previously undiscovered composer. My partner and I want to make sure that you... Our hand-picked guest list of musical aficionados. Worry for not and want for nothing while we uncover. Discover. And possibly never recover from. Songs, scenes, and stories. The, the Broadway, Broadway Your, Your Way, Way Soiree. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, tonight's composer is composed of, uh, what was the name of your first pet, sir? Bosco. 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 Uh -huh. Thank you. And uh, what was the name of the street that you grew up on? Laurel Avenue. Laurel Avenue. Bosco. Laurel. We'll take Laurel. Yes. Bosco Laurel. Laurel. Tonight we celebrate the music and art of Bosco Laurel. A formerly unknown musical theater genius. <laughs> and speaking of unknown, you don't know us, but we are the executors of the estate of Bosco Laurel. We have been tasked with preserving Bosco Laurel's legacy and music forever. With the help of Smadge Hedgelbrand, the one-man band. Yes. We will light up the night with the stories of the past. We will delve deep into the canon of Bosco Laurel and find those moments, those magical musical moments, where magical musical memories dwell. Perhaps, or just sing some songs. Or just sing some songs. <laughs> Bosco Laurel's story begins in, uh, what's the year that your grandmother was born, sir? 1905. Not five. That is the year that Bosco Laurel wrote his first song. Many people don't know it. But uh, this song of Bosco Laurel's was dedicated to a favorite wooden plank that lived outside of his house and mm -hmm. captured his attention as a young child. Minnesota had a lot of things to offer, and a lot of it was a lot of spare wood that had been left around from building sites. So Bosco Laurel, as he passed that wooden plank every day, would look at it, wave to it, salute it sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he'd leave a little poultice of nuts and herbs. He made a relationship with this plank. And this is a song he wrote, and it's called Endlessly. Very advanced for a child of 12 to work Indeed. in such a conceptual way. Uh, while other people were writing songs like My Granny's Fanny, he was having none of that. Instead, he was almost poetic in his approach to songwriting. Like an early a, Rod McEwen. Inspired by Stephen Foster and some of the early Americana, Bosco Laurel's song Endlessly goes like this. I've been sitting here watching the snow fall daily 
trying to put on a face that's brave and looking gaily at a world that passes by but never seems to change, you see. It appears as if my life will go on endlessly. Yet I know that I will change in time. I'll grow to be a man. I will leave behind those childish things. And yes, I hope, I hope I can. I'll turn from a tiny sprig or bush unto a mighty tree. Because I know my life will grow and I'll grow endlessly. The clock can tick, I'll keep moving through. I'll meet people I'll love and you know me and you together may find someone. There's a future you see. If I could love someone endlessly. You are just a plank, I know, a board who has no brain. Though you're oak, you do like a joke, and it takes away my pain. Yes, it does. I like to see that you were a tree, and you're just like me in no way. But some way you will live forever. I know there's got to be some way. Some way, someday, some way, somehow, some way, somehow you'll live. Wow, wasn't Bosco Laurel some kind of songwriter as a young boy? A prodigy. Yeah. That talent did not go unnoticed by the people of, of Minnesota. Uh, at a state fair, the great Minnesota state, state fair. fair. Well, people Cheese were... curds are really pricey nowadays, but then they were cheap. Yeah, they would, they would pay you to eat them. That's how cheap they were. And funnel cakes, well, back in those days, they weren't even the shape of a funnel. It was more like a tube no, cake. No. But Minnesotans never... Playing. No. But the radio show, Causeway's Good Time Hour, mm. was needing some songs and wanted to showcase local talent. And uh, there, from Springfield, Minnesota, mm -hmm. was a young boy, Bosco, and he was ready to go on that show. But he needed a song that he thought would sum up the moment. Um, the, uh, there was a lot of snow everywhere because it was Minnesota. And Bosco Laurel looked around at that snow for inspiration because it was the only thing he could see outside his door besides the plank, which was now covered in snow. Like a blank canvas. A blank, blank canvas. And he wrote this song. Ken, what, remind me of what the title of the uh, song was, please. You don't burned mind. in my memory, but I need help. It's blank. See, like the canvas. That, that's how he started, and then he actually wrote something on the piece of paper. Yes, he did. He did. He, it was a beginning for him. He wrote, Crickets in the Wind. <laughs> this is a song of longing for summer from a child trapped in winter. And so many of the people who were hunkered down in their homes as the wind blew off the plains and the icy, icy breezes would lock people inside behind their drifts longed for the sound of crickets in the wind. All I hear is silence Everywhere I go All I hear is stillness from the drifts of rising snow. What I'm longing for today, something that would be fine 
is the chirpy, chirpy sound of little insects joining to make a mighty wine. Mm -hmm. But winter doesn't bring them the silence in the rift, the silent and white with the snow in the drift. Mm. But if I dream, I can hear them laughing away. Crickets in the wind, won't you come again? Chirp your little song for me one time. Everybody. Uh, crickets in the wind, won't you come again? Chirp your little song just one more time. I don't want to hear locusts or ants or bees. I just want to hear those little legs rubbing together, please. Oh, crickets in the wind, won't you chirp your song one more time? Yeah. Crickets in the wind. First prize from Captain Causeway. And that meant a trip to New York City. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. Bosco Laurel was on his way to the Great White Way. And he arrived in town with a suitcase full of songs and a thimble full of dreams. And an address. Carnegie Hall. He went there and it was closed, but it was the only address he had. So he sat outside, pulled out an ocarina, sat there on the corner. And matched the hollow sounds of New York City, blowing a little clay instrument with all his might. But then a, a deli owner came out, Mr. Shivovitz. Mr. Shimovitz, who said, please, get away from my doorway. Yes. You're scaring the customers. I'm just trying to make a living here. And he tried to reply, but his lips were frozen to the ocarina. And Mr. Shimovitz leaned in and went, you're from Minnesota, aren't you? I can tell by the cold around your mouth. And he said, <laughs> he brought him inside. And as fate would have it, sat him at a table with a Broadway impresario who was looking for an 11th hour number, something that would cap his show, which was called... Uh, what was the show called? What was the show called? Uh, uh, what's an article of clothing from over here? A dress, yes. A dress. And uh, um, what's an adjective from over here? Some dis colorful. colorful dress. It was called Colorful, colorful Dress. dress. Yep. It was about the Milliners Union strike in New York at the end of the 19th century. And this was, the, uh, this was the call to arms, the marching song that was going to excite the audience as the union workers rose up and demanded fair wages for the hard work that they were doing in the garment trade. It was called... Can It! <laughs> hey, Mr. Big Boss, you made a lot of promises there. They're just there. You say you're going to work and give us decent hours. Well, that's just fair to compare. Talk, talk, talk about nothing. We get walk, walk, then you get nothing. And we're going to take a chance on the labor union. Labor union. Can it? That's what we have come to say, can it? Go away today, we say, can it, can it? Cause you can't make us work for cheap. Watch us leave, you'll be stuck well. Yeah. We'll make your life a, a living, living hell. hell. Yeah. You won't see a dress come off the line for a year. Not for a year, so can, can it? it? Mr. Oppressor, just can it. You heard it here, go can it. Can it. Can you can it now?
You can imagine a stage full of angry garment workers dressed in loud boots, stomping across the stage and waving signs and singing that song. That's the kind of impact that Canet had on Broadway. Soon, all the non-union houses were turned into union houses. A little fact, a young Upton Sinclair saw that and changed his life. That's right, I'd forgotten about that, mm -hmm. Ken. It was really one of the most transformative moments in Bosco's life. Mm -hmm. But he soon found himself unemployed because he didn't get paid very well for that song. That's right. The, actually, the people working in the shop making the costumes for the show now made a lot more than the people writing the songs for the show. But that's the way the story goes. And so he made his way to Tin Pan Alley, hawking a couple of his favorite tunes to see if he could pick up some work writing some great white way songs. Uh, something that would sit on every piano in America, something that people would gather around and sing as a family. And he knew one of the most important ways to get there were love songs. Yes. So this particular love song that he penned was something that transcended the whole June Moon Swoon movement, which was now starting to bubble up in Broadway in the 20s. Mm -hmm. And it reflected how the longing of the jazz age was a liberated longing. And it was called Steamboat Sally. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> Presaging showboat by a good number of years. It starts with a lovely rubato verse. Mm -hmm. By the river, I can sit and see the steamboats going by. By the river, I can feel my heart beginning to start to cry. There's a girl out there on a big steamboat and I know she can't see me but my heart belongs to Sally and it is my destiny I'll walk the plank to love's good fortune and mount the starboard bow. I'll turn the wheel in the right direction. It's towards the future that is now. I'll climb the paddle wheel like a staircase ascending to the sky. If I could only have you, Sally, in my arms are standing by. Together watching the Hudson River reflect the full moon in the sky. We'd sneak away and have a smooch under awnings by and by. We cuddle and coo and we pitch some woo and we make sweet valentine spoons. Together we find that we are one in my imaginary twos. Walking in the galley, making pie for the ship. Steamboat Sally, working in the galley, I'd love to kiss your lips. So won't you hang the railing with your arms and wave to me? Come back, Steamboat Sally, to the shore of destiny. That still is a touching song. Huh? It is a touching song. And, and it was just schmaltzy enough to make all of, <laughs> all of the eyes in New York City a little bit teary and a little bit hungry for more. 
<laughs> they wanted something else besides just Steamboat Sally. And this, uh, this next group of songs, because it's a medley for one of the hit shows that he had in Broadway, Bosco's star was starting to climb and ascend, and the Broadway of 1930 was ripe with competition. The Gershwins, Jerome Kern, Cole Porter, People were writing really, 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 really good songs. But Bosco was content to try. And he wrote something spectacular for this musical, which was called If Those Heels Could Talk. A picture, if you will, a pair of shoes that are worn by an heiress, a countess who is about to inherit a large fortune. And as she walks through her life from a young girl of privilege, finding herself surrounded by suitors, finding that she has a certain position, which now creates expectations yes. for her, and that she is incredibly charming and good looking on top of it, those shoes see it all from the floor. Up. If those shoes could talk, talk. the like Broadway, a, first Broadway like hit show. Yeah, but it was like Cinderella, but from the point of view of the shoes. Right? That's the genius of it. Bosco Laurel was certainly wow. just, just taking the cliches and... Boom, down the alley. Yeah, yeah, shot out of a torpedo tube. The first song was about inner youth, when she was vital, punchy, and happy they're ready to go to the world. Yeah. Hey, heels, take me down to Broadway. Walk me down the street and make me a star. Sparking low, bouncing off the cement. I'm gonna go, baby, I'm gonna go far. Hey, heel, can't you see the place where you were gonna take every step? Hey, steel, 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 heel. You're gonna be more famous than Impahotep. I'm gonna take a down to Times Square. They'll hear me clicking away. Old George Cohen will dance along with me. Hey, George, what do you say? Broadway! If you want to come along, there's a place for you, you'll see. Come and join me in my Broadway fantasy. So next, she gets a job working at a shoe store of all places. Because she wants to see how the people live. She knows that she's going to have a, uh, a relationship with the common people as well as the, the Regency and the aristocracy. So she wants to see what it's like. And her shoes are amazed. They'd never been in a shoe store before. They were in a box before they were born. Brothers and sisters of the pavement, I love you. I can see you've got your road ahead and the sky above you. Come with me as we travel down the pathways of time. For you to be stuck here all your life, it would be a horrible crime. Bo, bo, bo. I've never seen so many shoes. They look really nice. I've never seen so many people using a brannic device. That's a measuring device. I've never seen the variety of laces, eyelets, and heels. Let's get out there and try to see how good it feels. There'll be corns and blisters, corns and blisters, everybody wearing you. Yeah. But brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, that's just what us shoes do. And then the next song. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, start, remember the scene where uh, the Count comes in and says, Yes! Uh, wh what are you doing with Count your... Count Vigo. Count Vigo, yes, the Italian. What are you doing with the shoes? How come you wear those shoes all the time? You never take them off. Why? 
He goes, I could buy you a lovely pair of shoes. But you insist on wearing these same ones. Why? Why? And the first time those shoes ever felt threatened in their life. They didn't like Count Vigo, but he was the intended of our heroine. And the shoes sang a duet together, the left shoe and, and the, the right, right shoe. shoe. Are you going to take the first step? I'm scared, my friend. I don't think it's just a step to make this end. Maybe it's not our choice to me and you. It could be gone in a flash. I don't want to wind up in the gutter or an alley in a bin that's filled with trash. I want to kick Count Vigo. Kick Count Vigo away. Make him go away. Make him go away. Make, make him, him go, go away. away. Make, make him, him go, go away. away. I will put my big plant on his face. I'll kick him with the sole of my foot. I, with the right foot, will create a ruckus when I plant that shoe on his big fat tuckus. We will rock all over him the way he's walked all over her, and he will learn just what it means. He's just a count. He's not a prince, but wait till he's covered with our footprints. He'll learn a lesson. He'll feel not swell. He'll have himself booted straight to, to hell. hell. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. yes. He'll oh, be yes. in hell, and there will be no end to the way Count Vigo suffers in torment. <laughs> it will smell in hell like affected footy smell like a shoe that isn't washed or cleaned count vigo will be demeaned he'll smell he'll smell he'll smell This show had such an impact on so many people. Uh, we, we have a recording from uh, one of the people who actually saw the show back in uh, uh, 1932. It had run for a long time. Um, this is a recording from one of the ushers who worked at the theater and watched countless performances of this show. Well, I, I don't have much of a life. So as an usher of the theater, I see things over and over again. Now that I'm 95, the only show that I can remember is a wonderful show with the shoes in it. It was fantastic. And the songs, the writing was so articulate and the music was so moving that I'm going to have it played at my funeral. It was touching. Well, we're fortunate to have one other recording from a very young Dr. Scholes who saw this show. Uh, and how it impacted his life, well, you probably can understand. I liked his shoes a lot. I have a thing about shoes. Daddy doesn't let me go out anymore. That's all we have. The rest of the recording is lost to Snapped. history. But yeah, you know, tape. What are you going to do? Uh, but Vigo spirited her away. So he's going to throw the shoes in the garbage. And as he went to the limo, she stuffed them in her bag. The shoes. She wasn't wearing them, but she was carrying them. And she ran barefoot through Central Park inspired a, a yet unborn Neil Simon. <laughs> but not like this Neil Simon, which is funny and lighthearted. This was a tempestuous. Unborn Neil Simon. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, career-wise. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Say so more. She runs into Central Park, right? Yes, right. She's running through Central Park. Barefoot with everything that's on the ground in Central Park which we all know is pretty heady stuff. Yeah, there's grass and flowers. Broken bottles. Oh, broken oh. bodies. Ah, uh, bodies, yes. Yes, yes, right, yes. Right, right. Other right. things that dogs leave. Yeah. Uh, but he didn't write about that. No. No, but he did write about one of the bodies. Yes. In, in a piece uh, 
ripe with magical realism long before its time. One of the bodies, of, there's so many bodies, one of the bodies rises up in Central Park, looks at the Countess, and breaks into this dance craze number that just turned everybody upside down. Called the Spooky Doodle Doo. <laughs> It had a Latin beat as flying down to Rio was starting to captivate people. I like to see a woman with the feet in the park after dark, and I repeat, I like to see the woman in the park after dark. I like it. I like it. To see you hang from the trees, I like to see you hang from the trees and watch you sway back and forth in the New York breeze. I like it. You see, so many times the ghosts here in the park, we try to dance all the way after dark, but we got no shoes. But that doesn't matter at all. All the corpses dance. Spooky doodle do, spooky doodle do. That's what we all do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Spooky doodle do, spooky doodle do. That's all what we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Though the life is gone from all our limbs, we still can have some fun. When we spooky, 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 spooky doodle do, everybody joins as one. You see, all around the dark race are dancing, all through the park, and they know it's the right thing they got to do. Do, doodle, doodle, do, do. Spooky doodle, do, spooky doodle, do. That's what we all do. The dance of the dead, yeah. Spooky doodle, do, spooky doodle, do. You can do it too. The dance of the dead, so. Take a chance and dance with us. We're non-corporeal. What's the fuss? When you get done with it, you change your life. It's true. When you do spooky doodle do, spooky doodle do, that's what we all do. Spooky doodle do, spooky doodle do, that's what we all do. Solo. Why didn't he do that earlier, you're wondering? <laughs> this is what you can do. You can spooky, spooky, doodle, do. We will do it with you when we spooky, doodle, spooky, doodle, do. Spooky, doodle, spooky, doodle, do. Spooky, doodle, spooky, doodle, do. Spooky, doodle, spooky, doodle. It closed after seven performances, but I thought the usher had watched it for years. He's really old. Yeah. Okay. So he was mistaken. Yeah, he yeah. was. But it lived large in his memory. Exactly. It uh. kept alive in his head. Everything else went away. I mean, Sweeney Todd, up for the guy, gone. Gone. Just Spooky Doodle Do. Yeah, I said in the old folks on Doodle Do. Shoes. Oh, oh, is that right? Charming man makes good tea. Yeah, I, I believe you. At this point in Bosco's life, um, he was. Uh, happy to have not really suffered the, the hardship of the Depression. And now, as people were coming out of it and the swing era was starting to take over and dance bands were showing up, he knew he had to, had to write something. To bring people up. Yeah. It had been a hard time. Yeah. So something that was positive, something that gave them hope. They may not have had a lot of material possessions, but if they could fill their bread basket with laughter and joy and the future... They were well fed. Well fed. And that's why this song about, uh, what's a food that you ate yesterday in the back? Nobody ate in the back. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. 
avocado, avocado mixed with something from the back over here? Persimmons. Delicious combination. And very Really healthy. recommend it. Yeah, yeah. That's the two slimiest foods on the planet. And you put them together and it just slides down the mouth. It's beautiful. Avocado and persimmons. And this was a swingy number? Yeah, it was a swingy number. Yeah. Kind of bringing people up. Yeah, 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 it was. I can feel it. Yeah. The future is bright again, my friend. We're walking down easy street, it won't end. When you and me eat the food of the gods. The future looks bright, my friend. It's shiny and green and orange again. Cause when we combine them, we will beat the odds. They're unique. You've never seen them before. You'll freak. You want to eat them and more. You'll seek them out wherever you can find them at a vegetable store. You may be feeling nada, but you still eat that avocado. When you get it spread on toast with persimmon, it's the most. And you're gonna wanna eat it all day long. Green and red like Christmas time. Just like Christmas Comes all the year time. with it avocado and persimmons. Yes, it will, you know, whenever Take it down they to easy come together, right you eat them look in off your face. any weather. It's Don't you know that's the kind of fruit you want? That's the, the kind, kind of fruit, fruit you want. want. You yeah. want avocado and persimmon. The trouble was, for poor Bosco, that was one of six different songs about avocados and persimmons that were written that year. So while it was well-crafted, it was lost in just a sea of a, this crazy avocado persimmon eating craze where, you know what happened in the colleges, right, Ken? Yes, it was crazy, but it was like rotten avocados everywhere. Persimmons opened up, not fully eaten. The squirrels went crazy, actually attacked a couple of students at NYU. That led the provost to just ban both foods. You couldn't get an avocado or a persimmon in NYU. Until uh, 2019. It's, it had stayed on the books for a long time. The impact of popular music is underestimated. It can change cultural mores and restaurant menus. And in religion. Remember the limbo? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway. Uh, this is now leading into the, the war years. And uh, Bosco gets drafted. Yeah. He's uh, uh, sitting in Fort... He's a clerk typist at Fort Knox, Kentucky. That's it. Fort Knox. Fort <laughs> Knox, Kentucky. Fort Myers, but yes, Fort Knox, Kentucky. Home of the gold. And he wanted to write something that would be golden. He knew that. Uh, they, they were looking for things that would inspire the troops. Yes. And while he was tapping away on his pencil inside his barracks... He was tapping on his pencil. Well, you know, tap, 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 because he wasn't doing any writing. Right. He was that, just that, like tapping his that's head. That's how he thought about it. He got rhythm. Yeah. rhythm. Rhythm, 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 right? Yeah, it comes in. Later we'll find out it. Yeah. he created a contusion, which led to a, a welt in his brain. And well, it's a long story. Yeah. Um, uh, probably the end of the story, actually. But right. But all that We're, tapping with the pencil yes, boy. led us to a title of a song that he loved called yeah. I Ain't in the Flow No Mo. out of touch she'll tell you that much I don't know where to go I'm stuck in my uniform practicing cuneiform it's nothing to do for a Joe I just ain't in the flow no more Writing reports for the sergeant is not much fun. No, 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 no. 
I'd like to be out there fighting Jerry's with the gun. Whoa, 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 whoa. But it appears that it ain't gonna be so. Cause I, I ain't in the flow no more. I've been conscripted, that is true. There's so many things that I can't do. I can mount a cannon, I can push through shells. There Hedgehog Brand. Yeah, bring it down. Bring it down, baby. Everybody in my barracks got leave but me. Woe is me. I'm sitting on my bunk, feeling bunk, filled with misery. Misery. I feel like private last class. I don't you know because I ain't in the flow no more. No. Everybody went to a Broadway show but me. Everybody met a girl at the automat but me. I'm feeling so sad while other people are out there. Finding riches, I'm stuck inside this place just digging, digging ditches, and I ain't no, no, I no. Ain't in the flow no I ain't in the flow no more. No, no. I ain't in the flow no more. suddenly incorporated the blues into his writing. And he found that there was a whole lot of popular music out there that previously he had not been exposed to. It was thanks to other African-American people in the company that he was with, where he heard all kinds of what was then called race music. But those race records did give him an insight and an opportunity which he took full advantage of. Yes, he did. He was not above writing a doo-wop song when doo-wop was ascending. And that's exactly what he did. He wrote this next song um, that, oh, yes, Ken's going to find it in the archive. Let's see if it's the one you're thinking of. Everybody shout out the title you think it is, and then we'll read it whether this is it, because it was a very popular song for Bosco, and I know you know it. <laughs> so one, two, three, what's it called? NyQuil. <laughs> NyQuil. NyQuil. <laughs> That's what it said? Yes, it says, no, it's... That was it. Thank what you are for the, What are the odds? Yeah. Nyquil. Long Actually, before it's condensed. It was originally called Nightquill. Yes. Nightquill. Uh, about a poet. A poet with a quill pen who, night. who wrote it. Night. An unusual topic for a doo wop song. And yet, Bosco still found that there was some treasures there. So imagine a poet like Blake or Robert oh, Burns sitting around a burning oh, trash can oh, holding a piece oh, of paper. Oh, I'm trying to Peter Here I sit, sitting by the fire on the street. I keep my pencil sharp, but I repeat, I can't repeat. It's like 
my head's congested I just can't write I'm by this flaming can Each and every night I have the idea And I've got the will But I need, I need, I need, I need my night quill Oh, come about Oh, oh, come about I will I hope you will come back come back and bring me the will you know baby I love you so much your inspiration means everything to me but somehow at this moment I'm blocked like a chalk eating dog I don't know what to do please come into my heart fill up the vessels of my mind and make the pen do the magic that it wants. Let me dip my point and make a point so I can write my love letter to you. To you. Oh, night will. Won't you do the thing you do? Won't you do the thing you do? Won't you do the thing you do, Night Will? Won't you do the thing you The one man face. band, yes. Golden voice, golden fingers. Well, Bosco Laurel had a hit, but it still rankled him mm -hmm. that a certain pharmaceutical company took his idea and named a multi-million dollar product after it without giving him any compensation. So the next time you're shopping and you buy NyQuil, I hope you'll think about a poor composer mm -hmm. who gave that idea away and regretted it. I've really brought the room down. I know. But you know what? It needed Sorry, to happen. I, I, I shouldn't have said anything about it, really. So, Don't get uh, political. I get Don't emotional get political. about I know you it do. because I know, I know it's, you, know, it's a, you know, he could have had a fortune and instead he, no, he had to. That's a sad ending. Yeah, well, that is. That's not, that's not what happened because rock and roll was right around the corner. And in 1963, it bit him in the butt. Yeah. He had a rock and roll bug bite on the butt. And he wrote this song. What is it, Ken? Ooh, ouch! <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can't make this stuff up, ladies and gentlemen. You just can't. <laughs> ow! Ow! Ooh! Ow! Yeah. Ooh! responded, I cried, ouch, ooh, ouch, the way you got your teeth into me, I know I'm never, ever gonna be free, ooh, ouch, ooh, ouch, ooh, ouch, ooh, ouch, ouch. you know, baby, the body is swelling, I don't know what's happening, time is telling me that it's gonna erupt in a passionate love. I'm your 
was forever. Ooh, ouch, you bit me. Ooh, ouch. A catchy song, and yet again, tragedy struck for Bosco. Yeah. Because as teenagers were biting each other on the dance floor, a rabies epidemic was starting to just travel from different soda fountain to different soda fountain. Mm -hmm. And the Board of Health had to get involved. That was the great teenage hose down of that era. <laughs> they would round up teenagers and spray them with a fire hose. Spray them with a fire hose with a medicine in it. <laughs> it's a part of America we don't like to talk about. You can't find any footage no. of it anywhere, but uh, you just uh, go ask any, somebody who uh, was a teenager back in 63 about the Great American Hose Down, and they'll probably tell you a story. It was like MK Ultra, but kind of fun. As we transition out of the rock and roll era, psychedelia begins to raise uh, a consciousness and also possibilities for a now aging Bosco Laurel. Although old in age, he was still young in heart and soul. And he grabbed the psychedelic era with both paisley coated hands and rode that multicolored mirror bike all the way to a top hit. He had always embraced the idea of love and equality. He'd written shows about shoes that long to have a voice and belong. He, he'd written songs about uh, union seamstresses who felt like they were not getting their part of society or, uh, or being paid attention to. And so when the youth of the 60s started to raise their hands and say, hey, man, we have another way of doing things that we think is pretty groovy. And if you pay attention, you're going to learn something. And they believed that the center of the peace love universe was 235 Forest Avenue. Some of you may recognize that address. 235 Forest Avenue in a hip little spot. Well, we can go. It will blow your mind when you see the show. Get on your multicolored bicycle and ride with me. There's a man yeah. here. Do your head. He's got a big white head. His name is Captain Lang. And what he's got in his pocket will set your mind and spirit free. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, let your old ideas go away. Come on with me. It's a brand new day. Two, three, four, Forest Avenue. Two, three, five, Forest Avenue. Captain mixes up a batch of goodies and he pops them in this nautical hat. The ship is good fun. It's crazy and wild. You come on to it, baby, but it starts out mild. If you can get it just inside your reach, you will live your life in Laguna Beach. And you'll never regret the chance you took to go there. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if you smart up it, it'll take you far uh -huh. to the bright shimmering rainbow multicolored star. So you know where to go you know. and what to do. To do. Two, two, three, five, forest avenue. It's Oh, 
The flame and the flavor. This was a great era for him. Here he was at the ripe old age of 81, writing songs that were inspiring the youth generation. He was embraced as an elder statesman mm -hmm. of he freedom. He was He was at the first opening in Golden Gate Park with Allen Ginsberg. Yeah, the first human being. Yeah. Uh, I, he also started having a thing called a tea in where he'd have people in for tea at his house and they'd cover themselves with rugs and they'd sit and talk. It was a very warm and thank God he had two bathrooms. Yeah. Um, but there, there was a lot of history that he was able to impart and, and a, a certain wisdom that went along with it. And not all the tea was drunk. No, that's for sure. <laughs> This is where he. Uh, Do you think they got what I was saying when I yeah, said it? Yeah, they, they did. They're hip. They're hip. Okay. Look at their shoes. Oh, yeah. But this is where he started to become disenchanted with the movement. Oh, yeah. And he started to kind of pull back and became a bit of an isolationist. And this is where he wrote this song, which later Gil Scott Heron recorded because it seemed more appropriate. There's no business like my business, and my business is mine. <laughs> Filling out a lot of card there. So this is kind of like a later era Motown song, mm, yeah. uh, if I'm remembering it right, where it has the kind of fight the power power yeah. of it. Uh, and it's called There's No Business Like There's, My Business. There's and no business like my business. There's no business like my business, and my business is mine. Wow. That's a long title. It is. It's a long journey, my friend. Yes, and a long and happy life for our hero, Bosco Laurel. It was an unusual record because there was a long instrumental. Yeah, yeah. Group. Well, the, the drum DJs taking, liked man. it. You could wait for it then. Yeah. And they gave the DJ something to talk over while they were introducing it, you know. Hey, man, what are you doing? Why are you in here in my business? Well, I saw your sign outside, and I wanted to come into your business and actually buy something from you. Okay, but what's your business? My business? Well, uh, I'm an accountant, and I need more pencils. Okay, I got an accountant, so your business ain't my business, and my business is mine. Okay, I just wanted to buy a pencil. All right. All right. I just want to get that straight to you. Okay, that's fine. I don't know why you're so hostile. I just wanted to buy a pencil. No business like my business, and my business is mine. No business at your business, not my business to be kind. But my business I keep to myself. You see my business on the shelf, but my business is my business is mine. So your business is your business, and my business is my business, and your business is not my business, man. That's the plan. If your business was my business, then I'd be in your business, but my business is just the way I am. It's the eternal conundrum between man and beast. It's a terrible problem between man and beast. You want to come in and find out about me, but I don't want to find out about me, so I can't get away from me, so you got to do me. So just keep your business, your own business, and I'll keep my business. My business right. and there won't be a need to cross that line. No business like no business like my no business, business, business like your business, business instead. My business, my business, my business. Your 
business, your business, and my business, your business, your business, like my business is mine. <laughs> Individuality and commerce, two cornerstones of the American marketplace. And he summed them up in one song like that. But it was the beginning of a whole new wave that was coming through. And I don't mean new wave. I mean a new wave called disco. Yes. Dancing had come a long way from the swing tunes that he had written. His old friend Ethel Merman actually recorded a disco album called the Ethel Merman Disco Album. <laughs> And when he heard that, he thought, maybe there's a place for me in my songs, in this new, dance-heavy, beautiful, mirrored ball universe. But also he wanted something that would last longer than just a trend. He wanted something that was, well, frankly, seasonal. And so he wrote, Christmas in Berlin without you. down that wall, Mr. Gorbachev. That's right. And bring my baby back. Well, we're getting wrapping up towards the end now, Yeah, that's we? right. Okay. Remember that Gotta thing you said about his brain? Huh? His brain? Yeah, there was yeah. a... From the tapping with I the just wanted to avoid it. Pencil? I, the, I didn't want to get into it. At Fort, I know. See, yeah. it's so emotional for me, too, that part. Gradually, it's strange because it's a number two lead pencil is one of the deadliest instruments in the world. The graphite can permeate the skin and eventually cause a halting of the flow of blood in that spot where you're tapping. That's why a lot of people who chew on pencils die at an early age. But tapping a pencil on your head was a long, long process of self-destruction that he didn't even know he was doing. Yeah. It's, it's like slowly drinking 
a thimble full of graphite every day for like 30 years. You don't want to do it anymore after a while. No. So. Now you're really bringing the room down. I'm sorry, man. I did it once. No, it's fair. No, it's, it's fair. Fair. We each get one. I just wanted to mad image of a man in starchy underpants sitting in a broken chair. The microwave dings. And like a Rorschach dog going to the bone. He pulls the bowl out, eats it the same as he did every week because he's been eating the same food every week. And this is called eating your leftovers, AKA leftovers again. I didn't say it was gonna be happy, sir. Ding. There it goes. The microwave again is telling me it knows that I'll be eating what I ate the day before. I wish that there was more, but it just seems like it's leftovers again. Here I sit again, seeing my old friend Crusty potatoes and a chicken breast that will never end. I've put it on heat so many times, I don't know what it looks like anymore. But like my life, it's lost its flavor. I wish that I could savor just the taste of youth to come my way again. I push my food around like a pack of tone-deaf hounds haunting the raccoon of my spent youth. I know those dogs won't hunt again because I'm facing my own end. But when it's leftovers, my friend, that's the truth. I could take all the pain of eating the same thing over and over, but it hurts. What I want is one more thing, a tasty, healthy dessert. But the sweetness has eluded me. My taste buds are all shot. So pasty, crusty, leftovers, I'm afraid is all I've got. Oh, memory, yeah. Oh, memory, free me. And the ones who love me, I hope they don't see me lonely in my underwear. Lonely in my underwear. Does lonely the world even underwear. care? Does the world even care? I guess you're my only friend. I guess you're my only friend. Eating leftovers again. Well, what a they, great place to end the show. Yeah. <laughs> they found his body three weeks later. But stuffed in his shirt pocket. 
was this song. Yep. This final, hopeful, uplifting anthem to life and all its possibility. It was his way of going out on a high, and he called this song... <laughs> Schadenfreude and You. <laughs> all right. Because uh, he found joy from another's pain. It took him out of his own. It's a tool of sorts, he felt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it sucks to be you. It's great to be me. It sucks to be you. Great to be me. It sucks to be you. But it's great to be me. Schadenfreude. And you. The life and work of Bosco Laurel, ladies and gentlemen, the composer you all came to see, your favorite songwriter. We've gone through a giant, giant arc of his lifetime. Smash Hagel Brand, Smash. the one man band, making it all up. All up. Mike McShane as Ken Bellwether. Thank you all, and thank you for having us, Rick. Enjoy your night.